introduce the speaker of workshop two. Uh, workshop two is on evolution and uh, metabolic diversity. And uh, listening to Eddie Allison's uh, talk, then we are supposed to come up with a synthesis paper trying to predict how metabolic diversity uh, will be in the future. And I have my doubts now <laughs> listening to Eddie Allison's talk, how we succeed. But we'll try out to do our best. Anyway, I mean, um, Marianne Moran is the keynote speaker of uh, this session, and we couldn't have uh, found any, anyone uh, more profound than, uh, than her. Uh, she is distinguished uh, research professor at the Department of Marine Science at the University of uh, Georgia in Athens. Uh, she did a master thesis at Cornell University and then uh, a PhD in uh, 1987 at the University in Georgia, Athens, and since then she was essentially staying uh, at Athens, climbing up the career ladder from postdoc uh, to assistant professor, now as I mentioned already distinguished uh, research professor. Uh, her research focuses on microbial ecology, as you can also see from the title, uh, with a particular, fo particular focus on the marine carbon and uh, sulfur cycle. She was uh, and is one of the leaders uh, in using genomics, transcriptomics, uh, uh, in, uh, to address ecological uh, questions. And she also focuses on uh, not just on microbial communities and their role in biogeochemical cycles, but then also picking a few specific uh, groups of bacteria, like the Rosebacter, and looking into the physiology and ecology of uh, Rosebacter. So uh, I have the pleasure to welcome you. Marianne, the floor is yours. So uh, this is obviously a, a really huge topic here, um, role of metabolic diversity in ocean ecosystem processes. I thought, well, I can narrow it down a little bit because I'm really just speaking about microbial, but then I realized that didn't narrow it down very much. Um, but I am going to uh, look at it from a perspective of omics techniques or technologies, and so fitting in with one of the themes of the second workshop, uh, if we go out there and we're sequ sequencing uh, genes and transcripts and proteins. So, so what can that add uh, to, to our understanding of, of how uh, metabolic diversity interacts with ecosystem processes? Um, so this is a, um, a microbial view of carbon flux um, in the ocean, and I apologize to all the fisheries people. Um, the biggest thing on here is a dinoflagellate. Um, but we, we do know that primary production is, is microbially driven in the ocean, so very different from terrestrial systems. Uh, this 50 here represents uh, 50 gigatons of carbon per year, so the annual carbon fixation via photosynthesis equal to half of what occurs on the planet. Um, and so, uh, and from there, the next microbial step in the ocean, so leaving out all those other big things, is that a, a, a substantial fraction of that is going to be transferred so from uh, these autotrophic microbes to the heterotrophic microbes. And so that's um, these next steps. So we know that there are two uh, main groups of heterotrophic microbes that are studied uh, often uh, uh, separately in the ocean. Um, one of them would be the set of microbes that basically sit on their substrate. So there's particulate organic matter that's derived from primary production. It could be dead or uh, uh, senescing cells. It could be marine snow. And so some group of heterotrophic bacteria will sit down on that uh, and, and basically um, tr transform the carbon uh, from, that from that particulate organic carbon. And then there's that other fraction. So these are the uh, microbes uh, that, that basically scavenge organic uh, compounds, so metabolites that are released out into seawater. Um, and so there's a, it's a little bit of a less uh, direct uh, connection, but there's another group of those, and they are uh, primarily, we think, processing, transforming dissolved organic carbon, um, or DOC. And these tend to be free living rather than associated or attached with particulate material. Okay, so, so which of these is more important in terms of driving this carbon flux in this, in this step? 
uh, in, the, in the ocean carbon cycle. And so one really simple way that we can look at it is to say, OK, how many are there? So let's count up all of the cells. So if we take a liter of water and we count all the free living and we count all of the attached, um, so here's a little free living bacterium here. It's uh, typically, if we, they are uh, regularly distributed in our liter of seawater, it's going to be 200 body lengths apart from the next free living bacteria. And so that's actually 100 body lengths down to that guy, but you couldn't see it if I made it 200. Um, and so they're very different than these uh, particles where there's a concentrated community of cells. But it turns out if you do that count, it's actually the free living cells that typically win. So this is just a sort of a ballpark figure here. You can find exceptions. But typically, there's several fold more of these small free living cells than there are here. But they are small free living cells. And so maybe it's not just numbers that we should be looking at. But so let's actually instead look at genes. And so in this same liter of seawater, we're going to count up how many genes are contributed by each of these two groups. And so these are smaller cells. They have smaller genomes. They typically have lower metabolic diversity. So now if we make that count, um, we're making up a little bit of ground here. Uh, and the particulate cells are, are contributing a larger fraction of genes than you would expect just from counts. Um, and then now we're going to go one more step, a little bit more actually toward a process. And so uh, let's look instead now at transcripts, so, so, so the messenger RNAs that indicate that those genes are being expressed. And so if we do that, um, I'm going to show you data uh, that we uh, collected in my lab in the Amazon plume, um, looking specifically at this question about what's happening on these two different uh, groups of marine bacteria plankton. Um, so in the same liter of water now, we're going to count genes, and then we're going to count transcripts. And what I'm doing here is just plotting one against the other. So there's all different colors because there's different groups. There's all different symbol types because there's different stations. But the only thing you really need to look at this is whether the symbol is filled or open. So the filled symbols are ones where we're counting genes versus transcripts in particle-associated cells. And what you can see, so here's the one-to-one -one line. Uh, almost everything uh, above that line is a particle-associated community. And then things that are furthest below that line tend to be free living. And if we then make that same calculation, we're going to come up with something that looks like this. So still not quite even. There's still an abundance of transcripts coming from those little free living cells. But it's um, catching up because of these larger and more actively transcribing uh, uh, particle-associated cells. Okay. So, so that's just the number, any old gene and any old transcript. Uh, what are the transcripts that are actually being expressed by these two communities, and do they differ? So basically, do these two groups have the potential to drive different components of ocean biogeochemistry? And so to look at that, we can now pull out individual genes. And so uh, what's all along the bottom here, and I apologize to those who don't look at gene names regularly from bacteria, but it's about 70 different genes that, that the enzymes for which mediate a key step in some biogeochemical cycling. It's carbon, and there's nitrogen genes, nitrogen acquisition, nitrogen fixation, phosphorus acquisition, organic, inorganic. And so as you look all the way across here, what I did was plot that just, it's just a ratio of the transcripts for that particular gene in the free living community in this liter of water over the particle associated. So anything above the line is more abundant in free living cells. And so you can see that a lot of them fall in there, a number of different, um, all of those different categories that I talked about. Um, these, they're actually above the line, but there's no statistical difference. So from what we could tell, they're not biased toward one or the other. And then there's a group of about six genes out here that despite the fact that there's fewer cells, they have fewer genes, and they actually make fewer transcripts, they nonetheless uh, are um, uh, contributing more transcripts for a couple of different processes. And so if you look further into what those processes are, one of those is a gene for aromatic compound degradation. Another is a gene for um, synthesizing vitamin B6. And then three of them are for sulfur cycling. So using DMSP and then uh, oxidizing a, a sulfide oxidation level sulfur, which could potentially have come from DMSP as well. Um, so uh, some hints here that, that uh, if we start to pull these uh, uh, different types of communities apart, we'll actually see some differences between them. Um, 
so I just wanted to mention a couple of caveats here. Uh, I, I sometimes may slip in and suggest that a transcript uh, is equivalent to actually measuring the process, the biogeochemical process, but of course they are not. There's so many steps between a cell making a transcript and there actually being an enzymatic activity that's occurring in the environment. So, so um, don't let me do that. Transcripts do not equal rates, but uh, we can infer things from them. We can hypothesize from them, and sometimes uh, we can go back and check and see, see if that actually was the case or not. And then the other thing is, uh, so I, I managed to come up with these 70 genes, but so many key genes that we don't even know what they do are, un are unidentified right now, and it's one of the biggest challenges. So we can ask questions like this, what's different between this and that, but the, when we talk about omics data, that window that we're looking through is super narrow. It is just our view based on what we know, a lot of it coming originally from work in E. coli and some organisms that may not even be that relevant to the questions that we're asking. So um, we need to expand that window quite a bit. Okay. Um, so um, the amount of carbon that moves from, from uh, recent photosynthate into these heterotrophic bacteria is, is, is pretty high. Uh, it's about 40%, maybe estimates go up to about 50% of, of recent photosynthate um, makes this transfer. Um, and one of the questions we don't have a big handle on is exactly what this, uh, this labile DOC looks like. So what uh, the, these are likely to be metabolites. They're coming from living phytoplankton cells or maybe from a recently popped phytoplankton cell in a viral interaction. Um, but what actually are these compounds? So. Uh, it's a hard thing, it's a hard question to answer. We would like to know what are these currencies that, that a lot of this microbial carbon flux is going through on a, on a regular basis, but by their very definition, they may be high flux in terms of carbon, but they're, they're low steady state concentrations. So bacteria are very efficient at pulling these compounds down to low nanomolar. There's a large background of some people think tens to hundreds of thousands of compounds in seawater, and so these kind of blend in. So one way to get at it uh, and using sort of more of an omics technology is actually um, to use the bacteria plankton themselves as sensors. Okay, so uh, the way that we've done this is to um, uh, do this in the lab, so this is not field work, it's under very controlled lab conditions. Uh, we pick a bacterium that we know a lot about, and uh, this is uh, one of the ones that we work with most often in our lab. It's got really nice genome sequence, it's easy to grow. Um, and then what we're doing in, in these um, experiments is actually uh, growing this organism where the only source of carbon and nitrogen and energy are the materials that are coming out of living phytoplankton cells that they are co-cultured with, okay? And so we have some kind of control here, for example, growing uh, the spectrum on just a single carbon source like glucose. And then we, can, we do the same where it's, it's co-growing with the phytoplankton. We pull out the, um, the messenger RNA from both of these, and what we're doing is looking at what did this bacterium turn up and muster when its organic matter is coming from phytoplankton. And, and if we can identify what those genes are doing, we'd have a hint about what's actually being uh, passed to those organisms. Okay, so um, I'm going to show you data first from, from this guy. So we're growing this organism with um, a dinoflagellate. And so uh, what do you think? <laughs> these dinoflagellates are releasing. And so um, some of it we were not surprised at. We've known for a while that DMSP is an important phytoplankton-derived metabolite and that dinoflagellates are good at making it. But the rest of it was sort of a surprise. Anything that's listed around the edge are the um, substrates for experimentally verified transporter systems in this organism. So, uh, basically what that means is somebody, us or somebody else who's worked on this organism has shown us specifically that that particular transport system transports, uh, this is trimethylamine oxide and trimethylamine, and so all the way around. Uh, three different transporters that we know are transporting uh, polyamines. These are um, three uh, sulfonate compounds, so a purine um, and a sugar. And so these are the ones that we can say pretty much for sure uh, that, that the genes that are being upregulated are actually carrying out that function. So it gives us some idea of what those metabolites are, and it suggests 
that there's quite a, a bit of, of diversity in there. We're not talking about a couple of things, but, but a, a wide range of compounds, some of which we wouldn't really um, have expected. Um, in total, there were 24 different transporter systems. I'm showing you the ones we know, but then there's a whole bunch of them that we don't know. So there's more diversity of metabolites being released uh, from this um, organism than we know about. And here's the same thing, but it's with the diatom, and it's a whole different suite of compounds. Uh, again, so you can get sort of what these look like, sugars. Uh, this is an osmolite, ectoene, nitrogen-rich. Um, the, the one that was the biggest surprise for us in this one was this particular compound, um, abbreviated DHPS, and it's 2,3-dihydroxypropane-1 sulfonate. Uh, not a compound that you would think is, is an important part of, of this uh, uh, high flux uh, transfer between phytoplankton and bacteria. Certainly nothing we had really heard about uh, before, but, but we actually knew that our organism had this gene and this uh, pathway because of some work done by a microbial physiologist in Germany who just happened to like sulfonates. And so he found that these genes were present in the organism, but it took us about 10 years to figure out why they were present until we did this experiment. Uh, these were the most highly upregulated genes, not just the transporter, but about six other genes all the way going down the pathway, and they were upregulated 300-fold, so the highest of anything that we had looked at. Okay, so, so is this uh, for real? Is there a way for us to go from these transcripts to actually demonstrating that this is an important uh, metabolite uh, for, for uh, heterotrophic bacteria that are growing with diatoms? Um, and so what we could do, again, uh, because those technologies are available, is to make a version of this organism that's missing the transporter. So it's exactly the same as the wild type, and it grows just the same as the wild type. It's in green, the wild type, or the unmodified is in blue, and we can throw it all kinds of substrates, and it grows just fine, except if we give it DHPS, because it's no longer able to take that up. Um, and then what we can do is take that mutant and grow it back in the diatom co-culture. And so if this organism can no longer use this one particular compound, it should have a growth deficit. And that growth deficit should actually be reflective of how much organic matter is fluxing from the diatom into this bacteria plankton cell. And you can see um, that it's actually quite a bit of a growth deficit. And so uh, concurring with that very large gene expression pattern, it looks like um, this particular compound for this diatom and, and this organism is actually a major source uh, or link between the two. Um, and you can see this is a 17-day co-culture as the diatom uh, ages, it looks like it starts maybe producing some other things, so it's not always producing the same suite of metabolites, but certainly in exponential growth, it was a really important one. Okay, um, so uh, the, I think the next question I'm going to talk about, what am I going to talk about? Yes, the next question I'm going to talk about um, is um, looking at the, um, at how tightly linked this carbon transfer is. So, so uh, in, a, in a temporal time frame, uh, so uh, it, are, are, is the uh, photosynthesis that's being produced and released from, from the phytoplankton um, highly linked to immediate uptake and transformation by the bacteria plankton, or is there a lag? And this, of course, makes most sense for the, for the DOC, probably as opposed to the particulate. And so the data I'm going to show you here is actually um, uh, from Ed DeLong's lab, uh, work done um, near Hawaii in the North Pacific. Um, and so uh, what, uh, what they did was deploy this instrument. It's called ESP. It's being developed at Ambari by Chris Sholin. And essentially, it's just molecular biology in, a, in something that looks about the size of a 50-gallon drum. So it can do all kinds of, actually, real-time molecular biology and sort of beam the data back. But what they did in this study was just use it to archive cells. So uh, it was a Lagrangian study. They deployed the instrument and it floated along with the water mass. And over about two weeks or so, uh, about every hour, it would collect the microbial community. And then they they'd sequence all the transcripts. And so they're, they're tracing over many days uh, all of the transcription patterns as, as this um, uh, water mass moved in, 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 uh, and, and this guy floated along. So, um, 
it's kind of complicated, but, but, but the take-home message is worth it. So, so they found in total about 7,000 genes that were being expressed over this time period. Okay. Uh, and, and so uh, uh, some of them are, are coming from the dominant photoautotroph. So it's Prochlorococcus. It's shown here in green. And so any place where you see a green dot, uh, that's representing a Prochlorococcus gene. And then the network is just showing the, the correlations between uh, any of, of all of these genes with each other. So it's a total pairwise uh, correlation. Okay. So. Uh, the prochlorococcus genes are all uh, sort of uh, focused up here in this network, but along with it, it turns out, are most of the genes from the heterotrophic groups that were also tracked. So along with this one um, phytoplankton, there are six different heterotrophic bacterioplankton groups, and most of them were also falling in those same um, uh, clusters. So as you can expect, as they tracked transcription o over many days, the prochlorococcus genes are kind of uh, down during the night. There's no light. Then as, as uh, daylight comes up, they, they, they turn up a whole suite of genes to uh, capture light energy, to photosynthesize, all the other genes that go along with that, and growth genes. And so there's this real diel cycle uh, for the prochlorococcus. What this means is that not only are the prochlorococcus on this diel cycle, but the heterotrophic bacteria plankton are following along with that. So not all of them do. These actually come from a couple of groups that are typically small and free-living heterotrophs, and they appear not to be so uh, uh, keyed in to obtaining substrates from the phytoplankton, but the vast majority of them really are. And so what that suggests is that it really uh, with, within minutes to hours of the gearing up of primary production by these phytoplankton, a large uh, fraction of the heterotrophic community is actually following along as well. So it's predicting that, that this um, link here is, is actually occurring very rapidly um, in time. Okay. Not sure how I'm doing on time here. Gerhard, will you stop me if I'm going too long? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, okay. So, uh, kind of last but not least, um, so it's been really easy as all these omic techniques have developed. The easiest thing that we've been able to do is to identify uh, which microbe is which. And so it's not a small thing because before this we really had almost no idea of who was there and now we have a very good idea of who's there. But the question is, does it matter who's there? And so should we really be tracking these changes in microbial taxonomy or should we be looking at functional genes that are carrying out biogeochemistry, sort of uh, irrespective of which taxon they belong to. So it, it's a current debate in the literature. I'm going to show you two different people's take on it. Um, and the first one is work from Jed Furman's lab. Um, and so he has this long time series. So for over 10 years, every month, he's been going to the same location in the ocean, collecting DNA, and then looking at who's there, who are the bacterial groups. So. Um, and then what he's done in this particular figure is he took every single one of those samples, there's hundreds of them, and he did a pairwise correlation with every other sample. And he's plotting that the results of that pairwise correlation, how similar those two samples are, as, uh, as a function of how uh, far apart the samples were collected. Okay, so this dot right up here all the samples that were collected within a month of each other. And then as you move out, these are samples that are getting further and further apart. What you can see um, in, in the data, however, is that if a sample is collected very close to it or within 12 months or 24 months, et cetera, we're seeing a lot of the same communities, right? It's high similarity. If it's collected uh, uh, six months off, so it will be the exact opposite time of the year, then there's a really low similarity, and we're getting uh, this oscillation between them. Okay. So what that means is if you go out in July, it doesn't matter what year you went out in July, it's going to look like the July community. It'll show back up again. And so they say, overall, they're suggesting that there's going to be very limited functional redundancy in these communities because most microorganisms are not readily replaced. When it's July and the conditions are July conditions, you're going to see the same microbes coming. So in that case, we could look more at the taxonomy. Um, so uh, 
some of the arguments against this, and you can probably see it yourself, is, is that, yeah, there are these reoccurring communities, but it's not like it's 100% similar. So maybe the asymptote is around 40% or reoccurring, but that leaves a large number of species that aren't reoccurring year after year in the system. Okay, and then uh, uh, a uh, more recent version, this was um, published recently in Science, uh, and a slightly different uh, take on it. They, instead of looking at the same site, they went to a number of different, they didn't go to a number of different spots. Uh, other groups had gone to a number of different spots in the ocean as part of the Terra Oceans project and sequenced all very deeply many stations. Uh, and at the same time, they collected some oceanographic data, nutrients and temperature and, and silicate, et cetera, et cetera. And so that's down here, all those environmental parameters. And then they just said, okay, if, if we go look at the sequences that we got at each of these spots, um, and we just and we divide it up in two ways: either we divide them all up into taxa, or we divide them all up into functional groups. And now we want to ask: uh, Do the environmental parameters predict taxonomy best, or do they predict function best? And the answer here is going to be function. So uh, I, I know I don't have time to really explain all the details, but basically that's the correlations between taxa and these, and these uh, features, these environmental parameters, and those are the correlations between function. And so the argument here is we find that environmental conditions strongly influence the distribution of functional groups in marine communities, but only weakly influence taxonomic composition, so another point of view. There's some arguments against this as well. Uh, mostly how they got, came up with the functions, et cetera. But um, you can see, uh, depending on how you ask the question, uh, whether you're looking at the same location or whether you're looking broadly across a number of stations that were probably sampled at different times of the year, um, you can come up with different answers. Um, so I just want to leave you guys with this. Um, you know, for a long time, we've been struggling with you know, figuring out who the organisms are and what the genes are and who has what gene. And now there's a whole other layer of complexity that's being imposed on that as microbial ecologists figure out that the, the unit with, that we should be studying may not be a single organism. It may actually be uh, an interaction between more than one organism. And so that adds a whole lot more complexity. This is a really nice recent review paper. I think it's from Nature Reviews Microbiology. And all they're doing here is looking at what we know about interactions between phytoplankton and bacteria, so even at a very limited level. And so these are all the, the areas where they suggest it could make a, you know, a real difference in the kinds of questions that we're asking. Um, in this particular one, we, it's been shown that bacteria produce auxin and control and, and modify the rate at which phytoplankton that are co-growing with them well, will photosynthesize and grow. So uh, some direct effects on, on the, the how rapidly organisms are growing in the ocean. Um, and then the, there are bacteria that can uh, initiate a, a harmful algal bloom. That's been shown. Um, Bacteria, of course, are, are degrading particles uh, and, and influencing the downward flux. An area that I've worked on is, is um, DMSP, and depending on the bacteria that are there in their genes, they can determine how much of that sulfur ends up as DMS versus how much ends up uh, incorporated back into the food web. So um, lots of different um, me mechanisms by which they do that. And I just wanted to go back to Ed DeLong's uh, crazy network one last time. So, so when, when you first see this, you think, oh, that those linkages are probably because the, the autotroph is releasing organic matter and then the heterotrophs are taking it up. But those linkages may also be there because there's actually specific interactions between an autotroph and heterotroph that may be based on substrates going one way and something else going the other. Um, but there could be a lot of interactions sort of tied up in there as well. Uh, and something that's really hard um, for us to get at. OK, so um, I'm going to end there. And I, I just uh, have some uh, information from, from this workshop two theme uh, that, that might uh, stimulate some discussion. Uh, so how do microbes adapt to change? And, and I think our real issue here is uh, distinguishing between an ecological adaptation through a change in a community, et cetera, uh, with, with evolution, which, which on the time scales of climate change may actually be a real um, 
an important factor to contribute. Um, uh, switching around of genes so microbes can become other things by getting key genes. Um, next, how do we put microbial processes into biogeochemical models? And, and this sort of relates uh, to Eddie's talk, so do all these biochemical details really help us at the, at the level that we're getting at each gene, each organism, et cetera? And then um, also uh, this idea of remote sensing and in-situ observation systems, so, so is there a way to, to get at some of these questions? Um, remotely. So, thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Marianne, for this uh, really interesting talk. And I'm sure that there are quite some questions. You are it. Can you get my microphone, please? Thank you. Fascinating talk. Uh, so I'm super curious about the that tight coupling between the heterotrophic bacteria and the, mm -hmm. the phytoplankton. Yeah. The, if the, why would the phytoplankton be responding to signals from the heterotrophs, and, and what might those be? Well, so uh, it's really a hot topic right now that a lot of people are looking at. I would say uh, the most common and, and the most well-documented is that a large fraction of phytoplankton in the ocean, maybe half or so of the taxa, have absolute requirements for vitamins that they are not able to synthesize. And so a lot of what's been easily demonstrated, and so for example, even in our little co-cultures, Glossiosira requires B12, but it can't make it, and our bacterium releases it. So that's part of this co-culture, they're dependent on each other. So the idea, uh, you know, almost that you would specialize to the extent of requiring a, a metabolic product from another organism. And some of it may not, may be more, uh, parasitic or, or uh, you know, the oxen, who knows? I mean, they could just be out there forcing them to grow, right, by providing a compound that, that is known to do that. So, yeah, all different possibilities are there. Yeah. Further questions? Nina, I think. Yeah. You've shown this really nice um, kind of like mechanistic understanding really between different bacterial groups. And I'm just wondering how easy is that to translate this kind of approach methods to, to high traffic levels? I mean higher, I'm talking about phytoplankton, zooplankton. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that higher. Um, I, yeah, I, I, I wish I could give you an answer to that. I mean, really we're, we're at the stage where we're just trying to figure out how prevalent those are and can we ignore them? Right? Are, are they something that is actually changing the, you know, the, that suite of processes that they hypothesized in that review paper? To what extent do they affect how fast phytoplankton grow and photosynthesize and et cetera? And, and so you know, I don't know the answer. Um, and, and then and somehow understanding then how that affects you know, larger things, even you know, fisheries, for example, or are, are bacteria affecting how much phytoplankton biomass is there and how much product, primary productivity there is for the entire food web. So, yeah, if anybody has an idea, you should speak up. But I, <laughs> it's kind of something we just started wrestling with in the field, I would say. Yeah. Further? Yeah, Tian. Okay. Um, my name's Alistair Marianne. Um, when we do biogeochemical models and we put in a, um, the um, biology part of it, we'll put in an NPZ model yeah. and it will have a couple of types of nutrients, a couple of types of phytoplankton, a couple of types of zooplankton. When it has to have microbes in it, how many functional groups do you yeah. think we can get away with putting in? Yeah. So um, actually I have a good answer for that one because Victoria is here and um, Victoria Coles is a modeler and, and we worked together on an Amazon River model that she has a, um, a poster for. And so in that case it was actually trying to model, so we can go out and measure the transcripts and then she can use the model to see if she can recreate those and, and using it in a, in a way that computationally is, is uh, less difficult to do. So I'm going to refer you to, to her um, poster, uh, but she certainly, say 100 or she she's going to say 83? Oh. What did she, <laughs> how, what was, what was the number? <laughs> 83, was that right? 79. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
uh, Tatiana Reinierson. Uh, so Marianne, I enjoyed hearing your story about you know, thinking holistically about particle attached versus free living from the perspective of activity of a number of genes, number of organisms. And you drilled us down to this uh, figure where, we, where you showed us the genes that were um, overrepresented mm -hmm. in particle attached yeah. versus free living and then mentioned the, all the genes you don't know anything yeah. about. Yeah. And do you see any patterns there in terms of, are there more genes you don't, more unknown, genes of unknown function in particle attached or in free living? And, and does that difference, if there is one, tell us anything about where we should be looking for different kinds of metabolic responses under changing yeah. environments? Yeah, that's a great question um, and not something we've really quite looked at that way. Um, so there's just such a range of do we know what a gene does or not. In some cases, if it's nitrogen fixation, I can see a sequence and I'm like, yeah, I'm sure that's what that's doing. But in other cases, there are general annotations. It looks like it's transporting an amino acid. So do we know that or not? I mean, so I don't think so, because it may not be. And so it's so hard to draw that line. Way out on the end, there's a lot of genes that are totally unknown function. You don't know what they do. Um, I, I can tell you that most often, they are the ones that are most differentially expressed and that you really want to know what the heck they're doing. Even in our lab organism, there's, an, there's a whole suite of genes that fall into that category, and they are clearly regulating them, and they're clearly doing that when they're growing with phytoplankton, and we just don't know what they're doing. Um, so to get back to your actual question, we didn't really look at that. We were, it, it's a lot smaller group that we know what they're doing than what we don't, and so that's kind of where we focused. <laughs> yeah. But a great idea, something would be good to look at. Is there any further question? Um, There's time for sure. maybe yeah. one more yeah. question. More a, a quick supportive comment. Um, do all the biological, biochemical details help? I would say certainly yes. Um, looking at some of your diagrams, I recognize sort of familiar compounds like taurine, for example, and you talked earlier about vitamin B12. Yeah. Um, important for nutrition at all levels yes. in, in food, yeah. food webs. Yeah. And I know that one of my colleagues recently sort of found two different stereoisotopes of vitamin B12, Anita Ingr uh, yeah. Ingalls. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, the implications of, of understanding what happens at this level where huge flows of energy and carbon yes. and, uh, take yeah. place, I think, are fundamental. So sort of going right into the detail to understand, yeah. you know, how these systems function, I think, is vital. So you then translate it into something that Alistair can yeah. model, and then yes. I can read yeah. what <laughs> Alistair did. And try then and you can what the depress us even more. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I yeah. think uh, yeah. you know, tremendous requirement for I think yeah. that fundamental understanding. Yeah. Um, and not for predictive purposes as much as for sort of un yeah. you know, those understanding okay. yeah. of what yeah. the implications of, of change be, yeah. might be. And you know, Anitra's work is is really excellent. It gets back to the yeah. point there about how many interactions and so. You know, first we thought, oh, they make vitamin B12 or they don't, and now there's all these different types of vitamin B12 that different phytoplankton may actually be using. And so it sets up again these interactions upon interactions. So, yeah. Hi, Chris Buchanan from Tasmania. Um, so if, if the primary producers and the heterotrophs are following one another, and you can see that all over the ocean, then I'm just wondering what sort of effect that would have on Criminalization, and I guess I'm getting towards carbon storage, mm -hmm. because if they're all, I just had the thought that if they're all following one another, then we're kind of back towards the Martin curve of 1987, mm -hmm. you know, and it all being relatively yeah. static almost. But yeah. I wondered if you could comment on that. Ugh. Um, so I, so I wouldn't say they all are. <laughs> there, there are definitely some that weren't, and I would also say in this particular system, the the uh, very small uh, phytoplankton were dominating. And, and so, and there weren't really any larger uh, organisms for which you could imagine uh, silicate shells and, and all kinds of things that, that, that would form more particulate material and be longer lived, et cetera. So in this particular case with really little primary producers that don't really have that on them, then yeah, I mean, a, more, way more of the bacteria 
we're stress we're changing their genes with them. But I, I'm not sure it it, it uh, says the other is not a super important mechanism as well. Yeah. Yeah. Some more questions for the questions. If not, then I think we are pretty much in time. Thank you very much again.